I am uh, Joe Abdul Haq, and I'm delighted to present to you the Arabic Hour. I welcome all, all of our viewers to another very, very uh, interesting session. Uh, obviously, when uh, we have a guest like uh, Dr. Atif Qubrsi on, uh, you can expect the, the in-depth, uh, the breadth, and the, the, the horizons of any topic to be quite uh, wide and quite uh, deep. But today, Dr. Kubersi is um, well known to all of you. you you've, all the viewers have seen him before on this uh, particular program. And as you see him on television, a uh, professor at McMaster University and now uh, as an advisor to the United Nations. And uh, I don't think that I can really... Uh, read all the whole litany of his qualifications other than he's the basin of knowledge and wisdom and he will give us a fantastic analysis today of our topic. Our topic today, Dr. Kobersi, welcome. Welcome back. Thank you very much uh, for your generous, as always, uh, Joe, and it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you. And I, I know that uh, the, since the last uh, time we spoke, uh, you did visit the motherland, and uh, I, I'm sure that you, you're back with, uh, uh, you're always uh, attuned to what happens in that part of the world. But, you know, when you're on the ground and smell the air and see the people there, I'm sure things are uh, different. And uh, welcome back, and we're very, very honored and happy to have you on the program. Uh, I want to start with, as you know, uh, the whole world is talking about the, uh, the, the dispute of the, uh, uh, let's call them the gas fields off the shores of Lebanon and, and occupied Palestine. Every time we hear new information, we get more confused. Specifically because no one is telling, I think, not, no one, not two people are telling the same thing. Now, that's why we come to you, because we know uh, you, you will do it from all perspectives. And uh, can you please give us some background so our viewers can understand what we're talking about? Yes. Uh, there are new recent discoveries in what is now known as the Levant Basin. And the Levant Basin is talking about 122 trillion cubic meter of gas and about 1.7 billion barrels of oil. At prices in 2017, this accumulated to the tune of $550 billion. And now, with the prices of oil sky high and the prices of uh, natural gas have increased, tripled actually, from what they were in 2020 and uh, about two times what they were in 2017, we're talking about at least a trillion dollar wealth in the bottom of, of, of the earth. And, and what is absolutely a problematic about this are two things. First, it's contested in the sense that oil and gas do not obey national borders. Right? They do not really stop someplace, say, all right, this is the border, we need the visa to go to the other country. Uh, the oil and the natural gas seem to be very much shared resources with many countries, including Cyprus, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Israel, and to some extent also Egypt. So the story here is that who has the right, what governs the exploitation of this wealth, this incredible wealth, and this wealth that has become more valuable given the fact that many are trying to see if it can replace, uh, if, if it can replace the if it can replace the uh, wealth, you know, the oil and the gas from Russia. So the increased importance, increased value uh, has made this wealth all the more attractive and has made the stakes 
of the different countries in, in what constitutes their share, all that more pressing and more important. The real story here is that, and the fear has been, and there is some grounds for it, is that some of this shared water, sorry, shared wealth, oil and gas between Lebanon and the, the Israelis, uh, is such that Lebanon has not given all its circumstances and difficulties it's going through, has not been able to uh, follow up and develop it as fast and as uh, necessary uh, given the situation. Israel has. And uh, there are really two lines. One is called the 23 line and the other one is the 29 line. Uh, in the past, uh, Lebanon was uh, content with the 23 line, which would have really had Qana, which is one of the large uh, depositories, but not uh, Karish. Uh, and to some extent, the Israelis were moving in on Karish, and to some extent, some people say, well, they might be also tapping into Kana by slanted drilling. So the story, why did the Lebanese think that Karish and Kana should be Lebanese? They're literally uh, empowered by what they have seen the United Nations divvy up the shared oil resources between Kenya and Somalia. And they found that the rules and the basis of how they shared and distributed this wealth, uh, it would really give Lebanon a much larger, about 900 square kilometers. And this is not uh, something to... Uh, dismiss or to take lightly and that's why they're becoming more insistent and trying to establish and to get recognition of their control or that these wells are within the economic zone that Lebanon considers defines where their wealth is and the Israelis have contested that and then the Americans came in uh, trying to mediate the terrible thing about why Lebanese are a bit irritated is they have chosen a, an interlocutor or a mediator who was himself part of the Israeli army and has fought in Lebanon. And there are many Lebanese who are saying that, you know, we want an honest broker. We want an unbiased broker. And then if we were to take uh, the advice and the mediation of uh, Mr. Amos Hockestein, uh, this would not really be in our best interest that we are not assured or can be assured that we will be having the fair share or would be using uh, his mediation to protect and to preserve the interest uh, that Lebanon has in these uh, wells. So to a great extent, what we are really facing here is a situation where the value of the resource is rising and the share of Lebanon seems to be uh, contracting. What the Lebanese are really saying here, let's see, let's look, let's uh, accept mediation. We... I don't think any of the parties think they should really uh, allow this to go to blows. And, you know, there are parties within Lebanon uh, and uh, there is a consensus that uh, this is a wealth that could basically and fundamentally be the lifeline that we need to kickstart our economy and start our recovery program. And that uh, we are living in dark days and nights because we don't have gas and we're waiting for the Egyptians to send us some gas or for the Jordanians uh, to share some of their e electricity. Uh, but why we have all this wealth and this is going to give us huge amount of money that we could pay our debt that we have defaulted on and have sufficient wealth 
that we could invest in creating jobs for our people and creating the economic capacities that would compensate the Lebanese who have been denied access to their own deposits by the banks. Just a follow-up question. Uh, You were in Lebanon recently, and normally when it comes to national issues or uh, international issues, some of the Lebanese leaders don't agree on uh, on matters very much. Are they, do the Lebanese leaders, the parties, the all levels of government, are they unified with their position regarding uh, Karish and uh, Hana, the, regarding 23 and 29 lines? Well, you know, uh, Joe, that it's uh, always uh, very Lebanese to have lots of opinions and lots yeah. of uh, different perspectives. But on this issue, Uh, there is consensus. Uh, they feel that uh, the protection of the natural and wealth and the uh, share of Lebanon is so vital, so critical for any future development and for uh, reviving the economy and for uh, replacing all the losses uh, that the Lebanese have suffered. Uh, this is very critical. And on this, there is literally a general agreement. Uh, there is less agreement on uh, how fast uh, they uh, sh- should do this and uh, whether the current government and the current political elite could be trusted uh, to take advantage of this new wealth. Uh, there is here a hope that there would be a new formula or a way in which the Lebanese can organize a special authority that will be accountable to parliament, to the government, and to the Lebanese people in a way that would safeguard this wealth and would prevent any possible uh, corruption or misuse or abuse. So there is really questions here about uh, who should do it, uh, in what way to be done, but there is no disagreement about the legality of the ownership of Lebanon, of the 29th line, and how important it is. Uh, some have really suggested that Amos uh, Hochstein, when he came, the Lebanese were willing to compromise by saying, all right, we take Kana, we give the Israelis, Israelis Karish. Uh, there, are, there are lots of people who feel like this is, for the Israelis, is icing on the cake. They have a very strong economy and uh, they don't have the economic issues and challenges the Lebanese have. Uh, this is not a situation that would allow Lebanon to be generous. This is really asking the poor to be generous to the rich. Uh, this is a situation where it is critical and vital for the Lebanese to ascertain their ownership of their resources and to have access and ability to utilize it in the best interest of the Lebanese and want to make sure that the political elites are online and are constrained in a way that they would not abuse or misuse or there would be corruption in the way they develop these resources. Dr. Kobersi, uh, uh, from my uh, humble experience in the oil and gas sector, as you know, that directional drilling is a technology that can really use uh, fields that are kilometers away. But uh, I'm very happy to hear, I think the viewers, everyone is happy to hear that there's a unified position among the Lebanese. And I hope that they can settle uh, this uh, quickly so that Lebanon can can start uh, gaining its its share because the other countries in the area, they've been exporting gas and oil for, for years. Now, let me uh, jump into... Uh, Thank you for describing the present situation there. But uh, the war, the, the ongoing war, and I don't know when it's going to stop, uh, the, Ukraine, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war, and it seems now it's a global war, uh, that, has, that has created new conditions all over the world. Obviously, it is affecting our area very, very crucially because our area is connected to everything else. Now, on the other side, let me add this, please. There seems to be some good progress between Iran and the U.S. on the on the nuclear issue. Uh, can you shed some light on these two? Uh, how is the war affecting uh, everything that's going on in the area, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, the whole area, uh, the, the uh, Syria, and 
uh, the progress between Iran and the U.S. Will that carry some positive results? Yeah, uh, these are extremely important issues, uh, Joe, as you know. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian war uh, has uh, raised some questions, especially in Europe, being so dependent on Russian oil and gas. Actually, so much so that about 48% of gas in Europe comes from Russia and about 25% of the oil used in Europe comes from Russia. And that Russia is making incredible amount of money about this, that people think that maybe is aiding its uh, war effort in Ukraine. And they're beginning to see that they need to wean themselves, wean their economies from this heavy dependence on Russian oil and gas. And they saw in the Middle East a possibility here of replacing that Russian oil and gas. The issue is a lot more complex. First, till now, there is lots of talk about Europe being able to reduce its dependence on the Russian oil and gas. Uh, So far, uh, they have continued to depend very heavily. Uh, There is really some um, minor adjustment. Okay, Uh, all the sanctions and the... uh, plans to reduce importing oil and gas from Russia has not materialized. Uh, Still, the gas dependence is extremely high and the oil dependence, only oil that comes by pipelines, uh, you know, uh, is is okay. But that that comes by uh, the sea is not okay. Uh, Yeah, uh, crude oil is... uh, uh, going to be reduced, but not NAFTA and the other derivatives. So there is quite a bit of questions that remain uh, on the table here. So far till now, Europe has bought $63 billion worth of oil and gas from Russia. So any attempt to reduce this remains a plan, something that they trying to do it. And, and, and the head of the European Union, uh, Van Dalen, uh, she said that by 2024, we might be able to do so. But this is definitely uh, going to mean something that the Middle East may be considered and being uh, evaluated as a possible uh, replacement. But what people f- fail to see is that Russia is in the Middle East and is very close to the supply lines. And will Russia sit idle and accept that this replacement takes place? So there are really issues here that uh, are not taken into consideration and must be taken into consideration to see to what extent that the area can act safely and effectively as a replacement is one. The other uh, issue, and that's really a a serious one, uh, there was talk about positive developments uh, following the, the attempt by the U.S. and Iran to re-establish their communication and agreement. But so far, nothing has come out of it. And actually, uh, the situation seems to be uh, back on the drawing board. And uh, there is now talk of trying to create a new alliance among the Gulf countries and Israel and Egypt. In a way, call it Mesa or Abrahamic uh, uh, accord. And, and, and many people are worried that this is maybe a formula for more conflict uh, with Iran and Russia. The story is not really comforting in the sense that uh, if there are going to be any stability or peace in the region, you cannot create alliances that become uh, the ground for more at the moment it seems like the 
a new accord that they are trying to forge and Mr. Biden is going to the Middle East and maybe advocating for it is not comforting, is not one that could augur, uh, could give really grounds for a more stable region. If anything, it is probably going to exacerbate the conflict and maybe uh, bring more countries uh, into that uh, conflict. And uh, a story so far, uh, not very encouraging. Yeah. On, on, on the U.S. finding alternatives, uh, as you know, Canada is, is a primary client. They, they, they are really increasing their activity here in our province, the province of Alberta. Uh, we have seen many delegations from the U.S. They're talking, more, they're talking again about the pipelines, and to increase production by about uh, one million barrels a day, and uh, and then they went to Venezuela as well. I suppose uh, he's not he's no longer uh, Maduro is no longer an enemy. I suppose, but uh, uh, how uh, what you just said about the Iran U.S. may be positive progress, uh, but Syria and Iraq they seem to be you know they're still in the same situation, very precarious situation. Nobody knows what's happening. Can you give us some, shed some light on, on Syria specifically and the oil that Syria produces is being stolen? And Iraq, they, they said that they've just paid their last penny of, uh, quote unquote, the, the war debt. Where, where, do we, where do they stand? Okay. Uh, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Look, uh, once the oil shortage uh, on the world market, uh, was starting to reflect itself in expensive uh, prices at the pump, uh, many people felt the pain. So the war is happening in the Ukraine, but uh, people in New York or Boston or California are paying uh, very high prices. Uh, uh, you know, the gallon price in the U.S. is $5. Uh, the liter price in Canada is... Uh, $2 and uh, $2.20 and, and went up to $2.70 in Vancouver. And, and these are extremely high prices and people cannot afford and has cut into their purchasing power. And people are beginning to complain that uh, what is it and what's in it for us to be in a war and to uh, escalate the conflict that could, uh, you know, become more devastating uh, and and more uh, damaging, especially uh, so far, uh, you know, it has been uh, constrained and contained. But what if it becomes really a more open conflict? And God knows you know, the situation could uh, uh, destabilize into a nuclear war. So far, the world has become, has, be, has been... Um, you know, more careful and, and have avoided it. But how far can you avoid it if it continues? The other thing is that uh, the U.S. Uh, jumped to Venezuela because it has oil probably more than Saudi Arabia. But the story is, why should the Venezuelans uh, accommodate and come forth and supply more oil? Uh, they are... Uh, enjoying uh, the uh, high prices and making up for all the losses that they had suffered during COVID when the price of oil dipped to below $20. The second thing is that the United States has really taken a position where it, they were pursuing regime change in Venezuela, and the Venezuelans are not too happy with what had happened, and they're not willing to come to the aid of the Americans, given all the hostilities the Americans uh, had shown towards Venezuela. And the other thing is the same with Iran. Iran has capacity to produce more oil and put it on the market, but why should they do that? They are enjoying, again, the uh, high, price. high price of oil. And at the same time, uh, they don't find that there was any obligation or they have any obligation to accommodate the Americans, given the uh, history of uh, sanctions that the Americans had imposed on Iran and have imposed on Venezuela. So the story here is that there is Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia has a capacity to put more than 2 million barrels on the market. They're producing today 
10 million barrels, but have a shut-in capacity, which is the maximum that they could produce without compromising the uh, integrity and the viability of their oil wells, uh, they can put 2 million barrels. But the shortage in the oil market because of Russian uh, likely uh, withdrawal or uh, people uh, not buying their oil could be about seven to eight million barrels a day. So that uh, leaves about six million barrels uh, shortage. And this is not going to reduce the price. If anything, uh, there is really now it concerns that the price uh, of oil will continue to rise, especially when these uh, Sanctions become more biting and less Russian oil and gas is on the energy, on the world energy market. Correct. Correct. That, that, that part, uh, I, I can tell you, I, I know you would be interested. You've been to Alberta many times and let's, let's be a little bit selfish to tell you about Alberta. We, they just posted the budget and we have a 3.9 billion surplus uh, that because of the, the oil prices. So uh, every oil producing country is very, very happy. Let me move on to the the whole area that we spoke about uh, about the syrian oil where is it going right now and uh, how how does iraq play into this whole formula because iraq produces i think about four million barrels now but syrian oil is being stolen get nobody nobody hears anything about it but where is the syrian oil going right yeah, the, the funny thing and the sad thing is that uh, American troops who are uh, stationed in uh, eastern and northern uh, Syria uh, have prevented the Syrian government from controlling uh, the oil wealth. And the Kurdish uh, group, Qasad, you know, that allies itself with the uh, Americans, have been tapping into it. And Syria is denied. Syria is uh, literally reeling from the uh, difficulties of the civil war and the incredible uh, number of foreign fighters that have been uh, deposited and thrown into the uh, theater, uh, the war theater. Uh, there is incredible needs for reconstruction and the Syrians uh, very much uh, need the extra amount of oil revenues in order to rebuild and reconstitute the economy and society, and they're being denied. And uh, the story is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, everybody knows that it's the American allies and Americans who have really stood in the way of allowing Syria to control its oil wealth and to tap into this wealth for the interests of the Syrian people. I mean, you're not hurting the regime. Uh, Americans say, well, we don't want the regime to be aided by any uh, of uh, the oil wealth or even the agriculture. But who is being harmed? It's the Syrian people. The Syrian people before this war uh, had zero uh, foreign debt. They had very low unemployment. They no sufficiency in everything. Uh, yeah, and now, you know, the uh, Syrian economy is in shambles and the uh, ability of Syria to reconstitute, reconstruct is very constrained and limited. And yeah. oil wells, especially at these prices that are today, could be a very significant uh, source for reconstruction and giving the Syrian people a chance for a better future. Yes. Uh, the sanctions and the continued theft of their wealth is making it more difficult for the Syrian people, not the Syrian regime, from carrying out and conducting their life in a normal, acceptable way. Correct. Right. Iraq, we talked about... A bit Iraq, about Iraq. Is, a, is, is a very major producer. I mean, four million barrels uh, is, is no uh, small thing. But uh, in the total, uh, you know, uh, amount of production of oil is only 4% of the world thing. So it's not really that high. But what's really happening in Iraq is that there are also all these 
regional factions and each one is vying for their share. So to some extent, the uh, area where the Kurds control uh, has more oil, but then if they take it and they only use it for themselves, what about the rest of the Iraqis? And the oil in the south, many people saying, well, what about the people who are in the uh, west and in the north. So there is really a question of redistribution of this oil wealth in a way that would bring uh, some equity and stability to the Iraqi economy. And there is a, a, a number of people who are raising questions about whether Iraq is uh, using effectively and equitably its, its oil wealth and to what extent corruption is standing in the way of a more reasonable and acceptable way of using oil wealth uh, to shore up the Iraqi economy. Well, let me uh, go back to where we started. I think the, the I know we talked about Lebanon, uh, and uh, I think you spoke about the possibility of arriving at a uh, at a conclusion or at least an agreement. Uh, now, I, I read recently a real list a list of all the decisions made by the United Nations about the oil and gas in Lebanon. It, it was really really encouraging, and it's a good backdrop for what's happening. Question number one, do you think something will happen soon? Uh, are they going to form a government? You were there, I think, when Mikati was, uh, was asked to form a government. He just presented the list to the president. Do you think they will have a government soon? Uh, I mean, look, I mean, whatever government is going to be formed, it's not going to last long. It's going to be really a provisional government in the sense that the elections of the president is coming in three months and uh, there is no chance here for whatever government that will be selected now to have a long uh, expected life uh, because uh, things are going to change uh, with the uh, election of the president. The second thing is that the situation is so urgent because the economic disaster that Lebanon is going through and the crisis that they are experiencing cannot wait for some of political arrangement. I mean, there is really critical need. Lebanese yeah. people have lost 90% of the purchasing power of their currency. Lebanese inflation rate is one of the highest in the world. Uh, Lebanese unemployment is extremely high to the tune of 40%. The number of people who have now fallen below the poverty line is 90% with Lebanese. I, I just heard from my family back home that uh, there is shortage of bread. I mean, you know, this is a very stable commodity uh, for any people. So the story is stability, political stability, clean governments, elite that work for the uh, good of the people, a workable democracy that is really living up to the expected uh, benefits of democracy are, are, are critical, are, are, are uh, survival, existential things. And given the fact that now there is a chance, there is this wealth that they could tap into and exploit and use, and even in the best of circumstances, it's going to get many years. But maybe it will give people, once there is a chance that this will be coming forth and that they will be able to sell it to the Europeans or whoever, that this would at least uh, change the mindset of the world and the uh, banking, the financial uh, powers of the world to accept that there would be viable loans that could be given to Lebanon. But you know, there are also the issue of climate change and many people believe that fossil fuel is no longer consistent with a survival of the planet and, 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 and the life, uh, useful life uh, of these assets may be very short and the daily dallying of the Lebanese and not using it as fast as possible. And this may really get into a, a zone where we call these stranded assets. And there are people who have estimated the carbon tracker, a very well-respected and objective uh, group of uh, uh, 
uh, researchers uh, uh, said that maybe by 2030, the oil would have, uh, you know, 50% of it has to remain in the ground. Otherwise, we'll fry. Wow. Uh, I, I think I know we appreciate your time, but let me, let me touch on a topic that, that not too many people approach because it's so sensitive. It's the Syrian refugees. In Lebanon, we we know uh, that uh, the Syrian refugees for a lot of the Lebanese have been a, a source of income uh, because of the billions that that is invested in there. But at the same time, uh, there there there's two kinds of discussions. One is, come on, eighty percent of of Syria is under the government control. Why shouldn't these Syrians go back to their to their country, to their home, uh, to their towns. The second one says, well, no, they are doing all the, all the work in Lebanon, all the trades, all the construction work, everything that has to do with development, the Syrians are doing it. And it's not, it's not in the best interest of Lebanon to, to let them go. Do you hear, I know you're, you're so well connected to the topic, you know, with, with your connections to the United Nations, etc. Where does that topic sit right now? Are they going back? Are they staying in Lebanon? What's going on? Well, I mean, one thing we really uh, have to uh, take into account, and people forget uh, how important the interconnections between Lebanon and Syria. These are practically one country that have been divided by the French and, and the Sykes-Picot agreement. Uh, they uh, severed the political relationship, but they never severed the economic relationship. They never severed the human interactions. I mean, a huge number of Lebanese married to Syrians and Syrians married to Lebanese. And what we're talking about here is a 35 kilometer separation. I mean, I, you, you move from Beirut to Damascus faster than you move between, uh, you know, uh, Toronto and Ottawa and Toronto and even Hamilton. So to a great extent, any idea of uh, separating these people and these economies is, is not practical and is not uh, feasible. Now, the other issue is the one you said that always there were 600 to a million, 600,000 to a million Syrians always working in Lebanon in any year. They basically manned the farms, the industries, quite a number of trades. Mm -hmm. And the Syrian investors, I mean, one of the major groups losing, you know, from the banking crisis were Syrians who lost to the tune of $60 billion. So to a great extent, this idea that the Syrians are reliability in Lebanon is not uh, reasonable or uh, factual in, in, in many respects. They're really uh, important contributors to the viability and vitality of Lebanese economy. But at the same time, uh, Lebanon cannot really uh, shoulder alone the responsibility of all these poor people who were pushed away by the civil war and by the uh, political instability. Uh, the international community had come and now it's creating a bit of a sore uh, point in the sense of saying, okay, uh, the Syrian refugees get fresh dollars because the international community gave them and this is far more than what the Lebanese get. So there are some uh, issues here and jealousies and uh, Questions raised that uh, uh, the current situation has given rise to that did not exist in, in the past and is fueling some of the antagonism towards, uh, you know, uh, refugees and uh, immigrants in any country in the world, whether it's France or whether it is uh, the United States with respect to Mexico or Italy and others, is that uh, when the economy is weak, uh, all these frustrations are always blamed on immigrants. And, and, and this is uh, quite often unjustified and is not uh, correct, but uh, these frustrations are there and need to be dealt with. And it's easily uh, dealt with in a proper and uh, cooperative way rather than allowing these jealousies and these negative uh, issues to trump any 
a reasonable, equitable, and a humanistic uh, way of dealing. Well, perhaps uh, the Syrian issue, we can, uh, we can have the pleasure of having you back on, uh, on another program where we can focus on Syria, the, the reconstruction, redevelopment, and what's happening in Syria, and the refugees at the same time, because within this hour, we covered a lot. And as usual, it's it's very difficult to cut off and leave when we're talking to you because we, the wisdom you give and the information you provide is very, very valuable. I want to thank you on behalf of the Arabic Hour, uh, and uh, I will invite our uh, our viewers to, uh, this is going to be on YouTube, uh, so they can go back to it and, and learn just like we learned. I always do. I, I go back and I listen to it privately, and I learn a lot more. But uh, I believe the time is up, and I wanted to thank you again, Dr. Kobersi, and I want to thank our viewers for being so attentive to us, and I invite them to join us the next time on the Arabic Hour. On behalf of the uh, Arabic Hour crew and people, I am uh, Joe Abdul Haq, and I say to you goodbye, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.